So welcome, John. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Fine. Thanks for inviting me, Chloe. I am very excited about your book, The Power of Bad and How to Overcome It. I have to say it's it's one of the most interesting books I've read in a very, very long time. I was fascinated and it's such a perfect book for listeners of this podcast because, um, well, I'll ask you to explain in a moment, but listeners of this podcast struggle with anxiety and I often describe anxiety as being like thinking thinking bad things are going to happen in the future, essentially. So, I mean, could you explain a bit about what the book's about and how you came to write it? Yeah, sure. The uh, uh, Thank you for those kind words. I'm really glad it resonated with you. Um, uh, the book is The Power of Bad, How the Negativity Effect Rules Us and How We Can Rule It. And the negativity effect, um, it's, it's this universal tendency. It's also called the negativity bias. And it's the universal tendency of bad events and bad emotions to affect us more strongly than good ones. You know, you hear um, a ton of praise and one word of criticism, and it's the criticism that, you know, that really hits you and that sticks with you. You know, you walk into a party and you see a lot of friendly faces, but if there's one, and they've actually done lab experiments on this, you know, that you'll pick out that hostile face right away and focus on it. And it's just, uh, we call it the power of bad, this negativity effect. And it's this universal thing. It evolved for a very good reason. It, it, you know, helps keep you alive by keeping you alert to, you know, to deadly threats. It, it served our ancestors well. But we're, you know, but, but it also could, I can really skew your thinking badly all day long. It gives you this negative view of the world, makes you unnecessarily fearful. And so we wrote the book to try and tell people, you know, how to understand this bias how to use it when it's useful, and it can be really useful, but also how to overcome it when it's not useful. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, everyone can relate to having those sorts of experiences of, yeah, you know, going into a work meeting and having a little bit of constructive criticism and that being the thing that just you obsess over for for weeks and weeks afterwards. Um, exactly I mean, writers are like this, you know, there's a rave review and all they focus on is one sentence that had anything negative. And I mean, it's really hard to overcome because this is part of our ancient brain. You know, it really, I mean, animals, you know, animals have the same negativity bias that they react more strongly to, to you know, to threats. And, and, uh, and it really just, it, you've got to learn to use your, you know, the advanced part of your brain that, you know, the prefrontal cortex. Uh, the, uh, the prefrontal cortex to overcome that gut visceral feeling that everything's going wrong. How does that um, come into play when we watch the news? I heard recently that doom scrolling, I don't know if you've heard of the word doom scrolling, was the word of the year for 2020. Which is oh, I've not heard that. It's scrolling, a great word. <laughs> scrolling your phone and you're almost addicted to the bad news and you can't look away and you, you're checking the news several times a day. Um, does that play into this, did you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we um, on this negativity effect, it's, it, it, it's useful when you're in an environment where there's a threat, you know, one threat to worry about, like, you know, like a predatory lion, something like that on the ancient savannah. But we live in this high bad environment where we're just surrounded all day long by people and we call them the merchants of bad because they know that the easiest way, whether they're posting something on Twitter or Facebook, whether it's mass media, especially like this, you know, there's the old saying in television news is if it leads, if it bleeds, it leads, you know, reporters know that fear, fear self is a universal, it's the easiest way to get attention. And there are people, you know, competing for attention 24 hours a day, you know, on, on our screens, on our phones, on our TV screens everywhere. And so they know that bad is the bad things are the easiest way to get attention and get that those instant clicks. So um, we're just getting you know inundated with this stuff. And then and and in the book, you know, we talk about the need to go on a low bad diet, basically. You know that you've got to somehow be more careful in what you expose yourself to, and learn to you know learn to see that. Uh, the biggest news story that is never reported is that virtually every trend in human welfare in the world is getting better. You know, we are just the luckiest people in history, but we can't, you know, see that because, we're, you know, the, there's this funny thing where when they ask people around the world, is the world getting better or not? Um, 
the people who are the least optimistic are people in the richest country. You know, most, you know, only 10, per, you know, very small minority think the world's getting better. Whereas when you go in poor countries, they, they see how much amazing progress, you know, poverty rates have gone way down, hunger's down, child mortality's down, incomes are up, you know, everyone's much more educated, literates, you know, in the literacy rates have gone way up. So all these good trends and people in poor countries have seen that. And so they're much more optimistic, but it's, you know, in the United States and Europe, we're the pessimist. Oh my God, things are going to hell. And it's, and the opposite is true. Really. I mean, you know, last year, obviously with the pandemic has been a difficult year, but you know, we are still the luckiest humans in history. And, and if we could only realize that and see, and see that and appreciate these good things around us. Yeah, I often think that it's such a shame, isn't it, that we have so much and yet we we focus on the things that we don't have constantly or the things that are going wrong or could go wrong. And it does seem like it's very difficult for us to really appreciate appreciate things. Um, well, you thing know, uh, I mean, psychologists are probably responsible for this. You know, Roy Baumeister, my co-author, who's the one who, who wrote the, the original paper on this called Bad is Stronger Than Good, a great title for a paper. And they noticed when they were looking and finding out that bad things were always stronger than good things, no matter where they looked. And they were kind of surprised because they knew there were some examples from economics where we, we care more about losses, about losing money than making money. The losses hit us a lot more. But they just found it everywhere. And they even found it in their own profession that, you know, last century, they counted up all the articles in psychology journals and, uh, and how many pages in psychology textbooks. And they found that they, there were just many, times more um, articles um, about negative things and very few things about about positive things. And, you know, that helped, you know, about 20 years ago, um, Marty Seligman, a, um, a friend of Roy's and a, big, and a very prominent psychologist, he founded the positive psychology movement, which was enough with the negativity. You know, it isn't all just, you know, neuroses and, and traumas. That, that you know that there there are tools we can do to uh, to become much more positive and, and so how do we use those tools? Yeah, and um, so there was something in the book that I think is called the availability cascade. Where and I'll just quote from the book: uh, <laughs> You say the number of people killed worldwide by Al Qaeda and ISIS and their allies allies in the past two decades is smaller than the number of Americans who died in their bathtubs, <laughs> and yet. That's the thing that that you say that people are actually worried about. People are worried about terrorist attacks, and yet, you know, right? Forty percent of Americans, you know, worry that that they or family member will be killed in a, in a terrorist attack, and uh, you know, that's the it's um, um, the problem is is that our brain tends to you know tends to look at dangers and rank them and decide how serious they are by how available this image is in our head. And we all have, especially in New York City, we all have images of those World Trade Towers collapsing. So that's a very available um, memory. And so the, so we fear those kind of things. And then the merchants of bad, the journalists, the, you know, the mass media, they know about that. So they then basically feed into that because they know that just, you know, so any terrorist attack, any school shooting gets all this coverage because they know we'll pay attention, we're worried about it, and it reinforces it. And that's the availability cascade that it just keeps reinforcing, you know. So these are very unusual events that pose very little risk to the average person, but we worry about them because the images are so available to us. You know, and we call it the crisis crisis, basically, that there's a whole industry that is in the business of, of hyping everything into a crisis, and there's this perpetual state of anxiety from people scaring us. So, how can we properly assess something then? If if the power of bad is so strong and it's distorting, you know, our perspe- uh, perception of risk and that sort of thing, how can we tell if something is right for us? If it's a relationship or a job or a, de- a big decision that we want to make, how can we actually figure that out? Well, I don't think the, that changes. I mean, you look at it, what the, the good things and, and the bad things. Uh, the, the important thing is just to correct for the assumption uh, that that the bad is the uh, is, is the belief that the bad things are bigger than they are. So, um, go through the same ways of evaluating the relationship. What am I getting out of it, and what am I putting into it? Um, 
what uh, what does the future hold? Is this is this someone who has uh, a good understanding of me and so on? Um, it's it just don't be be swayed to overestimate uh, uh, one bad feature of it. Mm-hmm. You know, Roy um, kind of kind of first got his glimpse of the uh, of this effect when he was in a relationship that 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 had some wonderful days and some bad days. And he got the idea of, of to try and assess this, to start counting the number, you keep tracking each day, whether it's good or bad. Uh, do you want to talk about that, Roy? And, um... uh, yes. I, I mean, I, I grew up, I, I never saw my parents fight and I hadn't fought with any of my girlfriends or anything like that. And, and this woman initially, when we were going out together, she was totally wonderful and adored me and, we had a lot of affection and so on, but you know, when that wore off, then more the <laughs> the, uh, the underlying dispositions in there, and she was used to uh, having serious fights and screaming and throwing things and uh, even physical violence, uh, which was completely a shock to me. So, well, I, I understand. Well, relationships have problems, and you can't expect everything to be perfect. So I thought, well, why don't I just Right down every day, am I happy to be in this relationship or not? And so I thought, um, well, if there are more bad days than good days, then I should get out of it. Um, But 51% good is probably not good enough. So I thought, "Eh, maybe somewhere around 80%. If it's 80% good, then, you know, you should accept the problems and try to work on them. But that's that's life. Uh, So I, I kept track for a couple months. Uh, and it just stayed stubbornly right in between at about 65 to 70%. So twice as much good as bad, but still that didn't seem quite good enough. And this is before I, you know, done any of this research or, or looked into this. <clears throat> and so well, eventually we did break up. Uh, but, uh, you know, later on when it, it came around and found that people are saying, well, it has to be four to one is about the break even point five to one. Uh, for a good relationship. So it was kind of surprising to me that my intuitive sense of it should be about 80% good is was about uh, that level uh, of what you need. You, you can't expect perfection uh, in this life. Um, so 100% good. But, uh, um, but it never got up to 80% and it never dropped below 50%. So she was, she was, she was good more than bad. But... Uh, as I later learned from the research literature, uh, unless it's four or five uh, times as many good as bad ones, it's it's just not good enough. Um, we call it the rule of four, and it, you know it's a rough rule that that um, that in order for good to win out, there should be at least four good things for every comparable bad things. And you know, and we advise people, you know, keep that ratio in mind when you're considering the impact of your own actions. Because, you know, one thing you do is one bad thing doesn't get canceled out. You know, if you're late for one meeting, you don't redeem yourself by showing up early the next time. It takes yes. more than that. If you say or you do something hurtful, you know, don't expect to just atone for that with, oh, you know, with one compliment. And, uh, you know, as you're running a business, um, and there are a lot of studies in, in the business world too, you want at least four happy customers for every unhappy one. And those comments on, you know, on social media, you know, it's the negative comments that kill businesses. You know, we have a chapter in the book about this one hotel that is just fanatic. In New York, it stayed at the top of the TripAdvisor rankings in New York for, for a decade. And it's not the best hotel in New York. It's not the cheapest hotel. But it just is so fanatic about avoiding bad things. They just want to keep their customers happy every time. And so they almost never get a bad comment. And that's how they stay at the top. And that really is, uh, you know, we talk about the um, about the negative golden rule, that it's not what you do on to others that matters. It's what you don't do. You know, avoiding the bad gets you so much more. Um, you know, leverage and mileage on that. And that's, you know, that's especially true in relationships. Um, um, you know, marriages, you know, the marriages that, that don't survive, it tends to be the bad things to make the difference in those relationships. Okay. So, so rather than worrying so much about trying to do nice things for your partner, 
worry more about <laughs> not uh, starting big arguments exactly. or making big mistakes or that sort of thing. Yes, a, few I did. a much bigger impact. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, some of the tips we have for you know for relationship are you know don't overpromise things. You know, because we all think that we can get more done. You know, than we we actually do. It's called the planning fallacy. And we think, well, gee, I didn't, you know, do everything I promised, but they'll appreciate how much I was trying to do. And it just doesn't work that way. You pay a big penalty when you don't meet a promise. And going the extra, you know, there's some interesting studies with Amazon that, and and people noticed that they didn't really care if the package came early. They showed no extra gratitude, but if it was late, that's what really, you know, infuriated people. So you don't get extra credit for going the extra mile. And uh, um, and it, it's so true also when, you know, when something, you know, when there's a negative moment in the relationship is trying to, to step back and use your rational brain and to think before you blame. You know, there's something called the fundamental attribution error it, it is that when, if I'm late for, you know, for a dinner with my wife, um, I, I know it's because the traffic was bad or something happened at the office or, you know, it was an external circumstance. But we all have this tendency that 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 if my wife does that, as well, she just didn't care enough. She didn't, you know, she doesn't love me, you know. So, and and we tend to attribute other people's mistakes to their own defects, their own characters, but our mistakes are due to external things. So, if you can stop back and give your, you know, give your uh, your partner the benefit of the doubt and think maybe it's it's not really their fault. There was a there was a good reason for it. Don't let that you know start to escalate into things because once one person makes an accusation, you know, and, they, and they've done these these experiments in labs where people you know they watch people try and cooperate if something goes wrong. It just you know the good things people tend to reciprocate one good thing with a comparable good thing. If it's a bad thing, they escalate, and then the other side escalates, and then it just goes out of control. So yeah, important thing about, rela- about relationships is many people will say, oh, my relationship gets better year after year. But the researchers don't find that. They're, they're basically two kinds. They stay the same. I mean, they mostly are starting off good. You only get, get married and fall in love and so on when it's a positive thing. They stay at a high level or they go downhill. So understanding that, don't think about how can I make my marriage better year after year and so on. And how can I prevent the downward spiral from starting and when you have that focus prevent the bad uh i think that's a very helpful uh heuristic a very helpful thing to have in your mind and approach to that uh, and what they find is when one is bad and the other does something bad in response like john said that really accelerates the downward spiral so that means if you're having a bad day or week or whatever and you're being grumpy and your partner's kind of hanging in there you have to stop being unpleasant before they start. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that, that's crucial. That's a big one. I mean, the other way is, I mean, you want to minimize it, uh, avoid the negative and minimize it. And then the other obvious strategy is for that rule of four is accentuate the positive. Try and, try and, and, and put in more good things in a relationship. Compliment your, you know, uh, I mean, my, my wife does a wonderful thing um, where she has said that she likes to do three compliments a day. You know, that's just, you know, that's a great thing to build up those positive things. And and then also just in your own life is, you know, one of the most successful things they found from the positive psychology movement is just gratitude and counting your blessings. You know, whether you do it every night or whether you do it once a week, it, it makes a real big impact on that. And um, um uh, there's another trick that is called, uh, the research is called capitalization. And that is when someone, um, when you have good news, you should share it. And, and you both benefit from that as long as you respond properly. Because if you tell someone, oh, you know, did something good happen to me at work today? And they, and they just say, oh, that's good. And then change the subject. You feel kind of deflated because it's not there. And you've missed a big opportunity where if someone gives you good news, you should Rejoice with them and, or at least fake it, you know, at least just say, God, that's wonderful. You know, what happened? Tell me more about it. Ask for detail. And it makes that triumph loom larger, brings you closer together. And it makes the, you know, it, it just made, it's accentuating the positive and making that victory bigger. Love that. Well, one thing I wanted to ask, and I know you, you mentioned this in the book, is around parenting, because I, for one, um, 
quite scared of I don't have any children yet but I'm scared of messing them up basically of you know doing something to or not not you know getting them to the right school or I don't know maybe they don't learn a musical instrument as a child and I will have failed as a parent or something um but it sounds like from what from what I've read in your book that actually it is again more about um just avoiding being bad parents is that right yes we like we have the the, the good enough mother line that uh, um, if you're in the top 90% or 95% even, that's probably good enough. Bad parents really mess up their children, but that's, again, just the worst ones. Uh, beyond that, uh, you know, getting them to play the right musical instrument or playing the right music for them in the crib or uh, holding their hands so they learn to walk a little faster. You know, none of that really makes much difference in the, uh, in the long run. There's even a theory that the main role of parents is to get them into the right peer group because uh, children are raised by their peers uh, more than uh, by their parents. And so, uh, yeah, one message is don't fret and worry about it. Uh, you know, especially in mothers, there's often a competition to be the perfect mother and do everything exactly right. But their kids don't turn out any better than the, the sort of average mother who... Uh, kind of does a decent job and so on. It's, it's really avoid the worst uh, and then, then let, let things take their course. So you, you don't have that much long-term influence over what your, how your child will turn out. Uh, build up their self-control, which is an important trait, and uh, encourage them to do well in school and, uh, and so on. But... Uh, um, but the details and being the perfect mother is, is unrealistic. You just drive yourself nuts. Uh, it's an unrealistic goal. And the perfect mother probably doesn't have perfect kids anyway. <laughs> because she's so stressed out and, 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 and that worrying about the perfection is going to affect her relationship with, with her husband. That's not really good for the children either. So the, uh, and you know, we extend that advice to everything else in, 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 you know, you know, be a good enough parent, be a good enough worker, be a good enough partner. You know, you don't have to do everything perfectly. You just have to avoid the basic mistakes. And that's the, you know, that's the encouraging thing. And and, the, and, and also learn to, you know, not expect perfection from your partner and, 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 and being willing to overlook it. You know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the, the Supreme Court Justice in the United States, um, uh, on her wedding day, her mother-in-law gave her a great piece of advice, which was that in every marriage, it sometimes helps to be a little deaf. You know, just being able to overlook, you know, your partner's things. And there have been some great, you know, studies done, um, you know, including by my wife, Helen Fisher, where they found, they studied the brains, they did brain scans of people who've been happily married for a while. And they find that the parts of the brain involved with negativity, with making negative judgments, they, they actually tamp them down when they're thinking and looking at pictures of their, you know, of their spouse, that they somehow taught themselves not to focus on the negative. And that's one of the things also that um, all of us have this natural you know, capability to do that. And it happens naturally as you get older. You know, the, the great thing about the power of bad, the, the really positive thing about it, if I, that doesn't sound like an oxymoron, is that it's a great way to learn. You learn from your mistakes. You know, you know, that's the best way. And one of the problems today with students is, is that they're not getting in the United States. I know that, you know, there's been rampant grade inflation. And, and so it, yeah, and we're not, penalizing kids the way we used to and so they're not learning as much and so young people really do need and they're very attuned to the power of bad young people they, they're much more affected by negativity but people as they get older get happier you know even though their bodies are not as good as they used to be they have more medical problems they're actually happier and the reason is is that they're tamping down that negativity effect they're stopping to smell the roses savor the good moments focus on the positive and as a result and, they, and, and they're more realistic in looking at things, too, so they don't get so scared by things. You know, during the, the, the pandemic, one of the striking findings in a public opinion poll was that in, in the United States was that young people were more worried about dying from COVID than older people were. And this made absolutely no sense. You know, I mean, if you were a young American, uh, I'm a young adult in America, you were more likely to be murdered, you know, or drowned in a swimming pool than you were to die of COVID. And yet they were more worried than older people who faced a much larger risk because that's that's the negativity effect. They're so, you know, they're so attuned to negativity. And you've got to try and train yourself to 
But look at this rationally. Don't just go with your gut. Yeah, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we're often told to go with our gut and you know, just trust <laughs> your feelings. And there's a lot of that at the moment in terms of, I don't know, even people making their political decisions on based on their feelings rather than the facts and, and what's kind of going on. And actually, often it sounds like from what you're saying, our, our feelings are going to be skewed towards avoiding negative things and um, misinterpreting, you know, what's actually going on. So maybe we should step back and, and be a bit more rational about things rather than listening to our feelings too much. I wanted uh, to ask about... I've never been a go with your a gut kind of person. There's partly yeah. long years of studying self-control, uh, going back to John's and my earlier book on, on willpower. Uh, going with your gut, uh, a lot of wrong-headed impulses and stupid, destructive uh, feelings that the, the gut has. The gut is not to be not to be trusted. I mean, if you're trying to choose what uh, carpet to put in your living room or something like that, and you can't make up your mind, okay, then go with your gut. Uh, but <laughs> for meaningful decisions about life and so on, uh, the rational brain really has a use, a useful uh, source of benefit uh, that can make our lives better in lots of ways. So, yes, don't don't trust your gut. I wanted to ask about phobias. I, I um, One of the things that I do is I'm a hypnotherapist and I've worked with a lot of people uh, to help them to overcome phobias. And very often that's about getting to the root of where the phobia came from. And nearly all the time, there is some reason, there's some events that happened when they were younger. Say they've got a phobia of public speaking, they were shouted at in front of the class, in front of all their peers for saying the wrong thing, or they saw their mum scared of a spider and then they, you know, developed a kind of phobia of spiders. Is, is that, is the power of bad implicated in phobias and why, why are they so hard to shake, do you think? Well, I'm not a clinical psychologist, so this is outside my expertise. Um, Part of what goes on in phobias is that the mind imagines something bad. So you know, maybe you saw your mother be scared of a spider once, but that isn't enough to make you phobic. And, and, it, and even um, you might not have personally had a bad experience with a, with a spider, but you start imagining spiders crawling on you. Uh, and so in your mind, you've had all of these terrible experiences uh, which are much worse than reality and you get a spider on you okay it's a little bit annoying and you you, you, you brush it off but if it if it doesn't happen if it's just in your imagination you can play it over and over again uh, and that that gets worse uh, so it's probably again this property of the mind imagining terrible outcomes and playing them over and over and, and basically scaring itself uh, irrationally and, and unreasonably. Uh, that's why sometimes people treat phobias by, well, go, let's go meet an actual spider and see it's not really so, uh, so awful as, as you've imagined. Um, we have a chapter in the book about um, uh, Felix Baumgartner, who's this great daredevil. He's jumped up yes. the tallest buildings in the world, jumped into caverns. He, he, he flew across the English Channel on these wings. I mean, he's just, you know, he's called Fearless Felix. And he um, was going to do this jump from the stratosphere. Um, you know, he's going to go up in this capsule and jump from um, like 120,000 feet high. And as he was training for it, I visited him in training and, and he let me put on his helmet. It, it's an astronaut suit they, you know, made for him. And I put it on. I'm claustrophobic. And I immediately say, God, this is really, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't mind jumping. I, I'm not, I don't have a fear of heights, but it's going up in the thing. And, and Felix said to me, well, yeah, it's kind of bad, but you get used to it. It's a mind thing. You, uh, you, you train yourself. Well, it turned out that a few months after I was there visiting him, uh, um, um, the whole project was shut down because Felix, in fact, just flipped out. He couldn't put that suit on. He became, you know, fearless Felix, the guy who would jump off the tallest building, couldn't put on this suit and sit in a, in a chair for the rehearsal as they were doing for this this event, and they brought in a psychologist to work with them. And they, and you know, the, and the veterans from NASA, the space program, said, "Look, either you can, you know, either you've got the right stuff or you don't. And they, and and if you're scared of that, you can't overcome it." Now he actually did manage to, and much to their surprise, 
and the psychologist talked him through it about, and, and part of it was he imagined the way that, as Roy said, that it, this panic attack we had, uh, that we have, this phobia, is something that we build up in our mind, and it's just, it just starts you know, coming out of control. And so what they trained feelers to do was they had to say, where do you start getting scared? And as the process went along, as he was going into the room, as he was putting on the helmet, they would say, you can't do the next step until your panic level is down. Don't let it build. You've got to stop and do deep breathing. You've got to stop and focus on the positive. He was amazed at how much different simply breathing and stopping. And so only once you've got the panic down, do you do the next step. And and you know, and he managed to conquer it and do it. It, it struck me. I, I was talking to researchers in, into panic attacks, people who, who have these phobias of, of public speaking or heights, and uh, and and they. And one researcher told me that the goal is not to stop having panic attacks. You know that that's not the goal because a panic attack will not kill you. You can survive it. You know it it, it comes and it goes. And once you can start realizing that. You know, that, that I can have a panic attack in the middle of a speech. Maybe I'll start stuttering. Maybe I'll do something. But the world's not going to end. It's not going to kill me. And once you can stop fearing the panic attack, then they don't come because it doesn't, it's lost that hold over you. Does that make sense to you, Chloe? Or does that... Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think one of the worst things about panic attack is thinking that you're going to die. You're going to have a heart attack <laughs> and die. Even if you're a teenager, um, and um, and yeah, if we can learn to just be okay with that feeling, that rush of adrenaline, and actually realize it passes and we don't die, then they don't come anymore. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you had any other advice for people with anxiety, people that they find that they're always going to the worst case scenario, or yeah, imagining the worst. Or did you have any advice for for people like that? What would you What would you say to them? Um, try to get your awareness here into the present. Things aren't as bad as they seem, and they're especially not so bad right now. The panics and anxieties tend to be projecting into the future and escalating worst-case scenarios. So let go of the future and just focus your mind here on the present, and well, it's really not so bad. Um. I mean, and, and it's trying to realize that when something, you know, when you're having these fears that, that you know, to, to remind yourself that, it, that it's not the world that's so bad, it's not your life that is so bad, it's in your brain that, that, that you're creating that and that you can, uh, and that you can do that. We're just so primed. And one of my favorite experiments we write about in, in The Power of Bad was when they were giving these, um, people would see, would see this series of dots that were kind of blue and purple. And they would ask them to pick out the purple dots, and and then as it, and as it went on, the prevalence of purple dots would decline. They also did this with with faces. There were friendly faces and hostile faces, and they would say, "Pick out the hostile faces." And as it went along, there'd be fewer and fewer hostile faces to see. But people were so primed to look for bad stuff that they would start misclassifying neutral faces as hostile. They'd start seeing bad things that weren't there. And, you know, this happened even though the researcher said to them, you know, we'll give you a bonus if you're accurate. Please be careful. So we just have this tendency. We're so primed to look for bad stuff and focus on it. And it's, I mean, it's it, it's trying to look for the good things and just keep reminding yourself that, that my brain is, is you know, is, is, going, is going to a bad place and I don't have to. And I, I think basically this thing of just going on this low bad diet that when it comes to looking at the news to curate, you know, what you do, because you do, you know, you can't stop, you know, I mean, I'm a journalist. You can't stop us from inundating you with bad news. We're going to do it because we know it gets attention, but you don't have to watch us when we do that. You can choose to follow people. And some of the most, um, you know, surprising to me and encouraging news was when, you know, because we hear all this bad stuff about social media, that it's, you know, Instagram envy and Facebook, you know, um, um, uh, uh, depression, you know, this sort of thing. And, but actually people on social media, although there are the trolls, the, you know, there are the flame wars, you know, there's the bad stuff that, that happens, the cancel culture, that sort of thing. But people in general tend to share positive things a lot more than uh, negative things. Because, you know, you don't send your friend pictures of a terrorist attack. Usually you send them a picture of a graduation or, of, you know, your vacation. 
And so if you follow the right people, um, then you get a much more positive view of the world and a more realistic view of the world because there's a lot more than four good things happening for every bad thing um, in the world. So if you can do that so that you're being exposed more to good things and, you know, just don't pay so much attention, you know, don't do that doom scrolling, as you say. It's not, I mean, that gives you that little jolt, but it's not giving you a very good picture of the world and it's not making you happier. So try to find more positive things to look at. Such good advice. Thank you so much. And thank you for everything you've shared. Um, everyone should go and buy this book, The Power of Bad. It's completely fascinating and so many interesting stories and scientific studies to, to back everything up, which I always really appreciate. So, yeah, thank you so much for, for speaking to me. Thank you, Chloe. We really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you.